sorry hi everyone uh, welcome to the release event for project 39 a's latest report on mental health and death penalty it's called death worthy a mental health perspective of the death penalty i am metri mishra the head i had the work on mental health and criminal justice at project 39a today with me are my uh, panelists uh, thank you so much everyone for agreeing to be part of this webinar uh, i welcome honorable dr justice murlidhar chief justice of odisha high court dr pratima murthy director nimhans dr sanjeev jain senior professor and head of former head of psychiatry at nimhans uh, thank you for joining us and welcome uh, just a few uh, rules before we start the first is uh, sorry we will end the event at 6:30 pm um, and uh, right after this we'll play a short video after which there'll be a presentation by me and then opening remarks by the panelists uh, i request the audience to please send in their comments and uh, questions on the q and a box if you are on zoom or uh, paste it on uh, put it out on youtube and fb uh, the fa facebook live or live um all right let's start uh, so i'm going to just play a video about a man we interviewed for this report his name is dharma ketu and this is his story these voices are in real but for dharma ketu they are he is a prisoner sentenced to death in one of india's prisons these voices get so disturbing that dharma ketu has attempted to die by suicide in prison when he was 12 his parents took him to a traditional healer because they felt there was something wrong with his brain it did not help dharma ketu dropped out of school and was violated physically and sexually as an adolescent he was sexually abused multiple times by people in his neighborhood and in his workplace people he trusted he did not receive any formal treatment until he was incarcerated dharma ketu spent close to 15 years in prison including over 6 years on death row an experience that has caused him psychological distress uncertainty about life and death it was in prison that he was first properly treated for the voices dharma ketu was diagnosed with psychosis nos major depressive disorder and intellectual disability dharma ketu isn't alone 62.2% death row prisoners are diagnosed with at least one mental illness. 46 out of the 88 prisoners interviewed had been abused as children. 64 neglected, 46 had to drop out of school early, and 73 prisoners grew up in a disturbed family environment. And the mental agony of being on death row pushes them further. with that story we'll start i'm just going to share my screen again in his neighborhood and in his workplace people he trusted sorry I'm he did not sorry. receive any
Right, sorry about that. Before I begin um, with the findings of this report, I would like to say a few thank yous. In particular, I would like to emphasize that interdisciplinary work like Deathworthy would not have been possible without institutional support and support of many, many people across both law and the field of mental health. I particularly want to thank the National Law University, Delhi, the current uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Rao, the former Vice Chancellor, Professor Anbir Singh, the current Registrar, Professor Goel, and the former Registrar, Dr. Bajpay. I would, of course, like to thank Dr. Murthy and Dr. Jain, as well as Dr. Gitanjali Narayanan, who's Associate Professor of Psychology at NIMHANS, for patiently guiding us through this extremely um, incredible journey that we had with this report. I would also like to thank Dr. Angela Ann Joseph, Peter John, Pankhuri Agarwal, and Pankhuri Bhatia for contributing crucially to the conceptualization of this project and its implementation. The amount of fieldwork that we did for this project would not have been possible without the students of NLU Delhi, other colleges, and mental health professionals who agreed to do this with us. A very, very, very special thanks to Chinmay Srivastav, Kanan Junjunwala, Varsha Sharma, and Vasundra Kaul, who were students at NLU Delhi, and through the entirety of their five years worked on this project and saw it to its fruition. Finally, this report owes a huge debt to people who spoke with us, death row prisoners and their families. They not only spoke with us, but they agreed to share their trauma with us. And this report would certainly not have made its way out if it wasn't for them. Before I present the findings, there are just certain things that I want to say about what this report in, intends to do. The Deathworthy, it's an interdisciplinary study providing empirical findings on mental health crisis among the death row population in India. It also talks about the psychological harm that being on death row causes. The study takes an interdisciplinary lens to questions that traditionally the law has imagined as being only for itself. And in doing that, it provides the law a framework to view individuals more meaningfully, the individuals it deems death worthy. The report also highlights important gaps in existing death penalty law. The mental health perspective that the report takes allows the law to look at individuals not as existing in vacuum, but people with an interrelated past and current. And thus the lens reveals crucial questions that the law has not yet been confronted with. The report does not deal with legal issues of capacity to stand trial or insanity defense or whether the person can be reformed or not. It, it presents data on empirical data on a mental health crisis and thereby raises a question. What should the law do now, now that we know what we know? For this study, we interviewed, we, we conducted field interviews across five states in Delhi, Chhattisgarh, MP, Karnataka and Kerala. We interviewed 88 death row prisoners and their families for, for this. And in these interviews, we conduct, these interviews were, were comprised of qualitative interviews for, with both the prisoners and the families, as well as certain psychometric tools that we used to understand the psychiatric concerns that this population was living with. The information presented here has been analyzed after triaging of information obtained through prisoner interviews, family interviews, and health records where available. Moving on. The report was conceptualized with three aims in mind. The first was to understand the extent of psychiatric illnesses in this population. The second was to understand the presence of intellectual disability among death row prisoners. And the third was a complex exercise of understanding the, psycho the, the, the psychological harm that the death penalty does, the pains of death row. However, before we, or rather to fully achieve these aims, we needed to look at the past lives of the prisoners, their lives pre-incarceration. And we particularly looked at adverse childhood experiences. These adverse childhood experiences that we found that you can see on your screen here, have in literature, in psychiatric mental health literature, been found to have links with both mental illness later in life 
as well as violence and aggression later in life. In other words, also criminal behavior. We found that 73 prisoners were exposed to three or more adverse childhood experiences. These experiences also do not stay in silos. They interact with each other. And we found that prisoners who had been abused as children also had to take on responsibilities of an adult during their childhood. And also many of them ran away from home during childhood. We also found that of the 63 prisoners who were neglected as children, many reported associating with deviant peers. And quite a few of them did not have education up till even class 10. Of the large number of prisoners, the very large number of prisoners that grew up in a disturbed family environment, a majority of them had to assume adult roles. They also associated with deviant peers. And they started using substances before they turned 18. In addition to these vulnerabilities, we also looked at events that in literature are known as traumatic life events. We looked at 17 traumatic life events and these life events become important because research has shown to have for, for them to have a link with mental illness later in life. Some of the uh, traumatic life events that we looked at were physical assault, sudden and, and unexpected death of a closed one, transportation accident, severe human suffering, and experiencing a life-threatening illness or injury. 56 death row prisoners were exposed to three or more traumatic events. Before I discuss the psychiatric concerns on death row, one thing that we need to remember is that these individuals are entering prisons as already vulnerable people. Being on death row then adds an additional layer of trauma. And that there is such a massive mental health crisis in prison, in on death row, where we found 62.2% diagnosed with at least one mental illness, it is not a surprise the wire would have tripped. The main illnesses that we found were major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and substance use disorder. In terms of the extent of the crisis of mental health on death row, it would be instructive to look at comparative figures. We found that depression, for instance, was much higher on death row than in prison or in community population. A similar finding we had for generalized anxiety disorder. And with substance use disorders, it was only very, very less as compared to community population, even though substances of use and abuse like tobacco and ganja are contraband in prison. It is also important to know that prisoners did not only have one mental illness, but were living with multiple. We found that a large number of prisoners were living with more than one mental illness, of which 26 had a dual diagnosis. This study for the first time also establishes risk factors of which are linked to mental illnesses while on death row. It found that prisoners who were socially isolated could not contact their families or were alienated from other prisoners or they were isolated from other social networks who were at risk of mental illness. We also found a, risk, a, a link between violence and harassment by prison authorities or the prisoners directed at death row prisoners because they were on death row to have a link with mental illness. Now, lack of work is also a risk factor and it's important because it is a marker of being on death row. Under prison manuals, death row prisoners are not allowed to work and this becomes an additional risk factor inherent in the way our justice system deals with the death penalty. Lastly, differential treatment because they were death row prisoners was also uh, found to be a risk factor. Coming now to the next aim on intellectual disability. The reason we looked at intellectual disability or it is often known as mental retardation is because international law, international human rights law exempts persons with intellectual disability from the death penalty. In fact, the US Supreme Court has noted that Persons with intellectual disability are at a special risk of wrongful execution. We found that out of the 83 prisoners, there were nine who had intellectual disability. And an additional finding 
was that over 75% had deficits in intellectual functioning. In comparison to the community population, this is a very, very high proportion. The 0.6% is the prevalence of intellectual disability in the community. Lastly, the last aim, the pains of death row. I think the law has paid very, very little attention to what it means to be sentenced to death, the psycho psychological consequences of being told that you are death worthy. And these pains of death row are extremely complex to unearth, particularly because as researchers, we have to shed our prejudice that we have, have been used to for people who are considered worst of the worst by law. And this is important because the pains of death row begin with the narratives of villainy outside and inside prison. There are multiple aspects of, of the pains of death row. And it starts from the very moment the person is told that they are deemed death worthy by the law and the system. One of the aspects which is inherent in the death penalty but is not a feature of any other punishment is the various missteps within the procedure. For instance, we found that for four prisoners, death warrants had been issued out of turn unlawfully. We also found seven prisoners had had their mercy petitions reject rejected and many of them have now been commuted. We also found that for two prisoners, preparations for hanging had begun for them to only be commuted later. Now we as people who are outside the experience may think that this was the law correcting its course, correcting itself. But for people who are in the system, for people who, who are to be hanged, this became an extremely torturous and traumatic experience, an experience that they carry for the rest of their lives. In conclusion, I think I would like to just say a few things, which is that this report shows us that we have been sentencing people with mental health vulnerabilities to death, vulnerabilities which only exacerbate on death row. I think it also raises questions about our current legal system's ability to catch accurately or to assess accurately whether the people it is deeming death worthy are indeed death worthy. And the findings on intellectual disability are extremely crucial for this. I think perhaps the point is that when the law prescribed the death penalty, it did not envisage the psychological harm that it would cause. And and this report and the data that is presented in this report also makes us confront the reality, whether we as society want to condone pain as punishment in the garb of justice. I think in the ultimate analysis, it raises the question, a serious question, whether the death penalty is constitutionally defensible. Thank you. With this, I'll stop my sharing my screen. Uh, Dr. Murthy, could I invite you to uh, start with the opening remarks, please? Thank you, Maitri. Honorable Justice uh, Murlidhar, Professor Sanjeev Jain, Maitri, all your colleagues from the National Law School, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I was a student of psychiatry, the first thing I learned were the differences between psychiatry and the law. How the former is concerned with mental disorder and the restitution of one's mental health and how the law's preoccupation is with culpability and punishment. The refrain was that the twain can never meet. So to me, Deathworthy represents the meeting of these two apparently divergent fields to see how law and justice can be more sensitive to the human condition. Traditionally, as Maitri was mentioning, uh, the legal approach takes into account the limited dimensions of competence, capacity, guilt, and justification of punishment. At the sentencing stage, the mental health of the accused is viewed, but from the perspective of penalization and considering the degree of responsibility. In the later stages, the concern for mental health turns largely in terms of the dignity of the individual at that point as a constitutionally protected fundamental right. A reformulation which takes into account vulnerabilities and support needs of the accused rather than a lack of capacity would be in line with the progress made 
with respect to the rights of persons with mental disability. Thus, uh, in more contemporary times, uh, criminal law jurisprudence acknowledges the importance of not just a diagnostic, but also a non-diagnostic model of mental health. Uh, the Indian uh, jurisprudence has implicitly adopted a psychosocial lens, acknowledging the impact of the social environment of a person on a person's mental health, while also retaining to some extent the symptom diagnosis approach. And I think the report has done both of these, look not just at the symptom diagnosis approach, but also look at the large spectrum of psychological distress. So such a shift from a purely categorical to a more nuanced dimensional approach to the understanding of mental symptoms and their dynamic interplay is also in keeping with the current understanding of psychiatric symptomatology and disorders, where we've moved away from purely categorical diagnosis to look at cross-cutting similarities across diagnostic disorders. In the introduction of what's been quoted as Martha Nussbaum, who traces the idea of justice, punishment, mercy, and equity, a line of thought that laws must be sufficiently malleable to accommodate the realities of each case and that the judge, before deliberating what punishment needs to be inflicted, is able to locate the offender in, its, in their context. I think that is the attempt here, to not look just at the immediate context, but really at the larger panoramic context in which this individual presents with that final you know, uh, issue at hand. Uh, Maitri mentioned about the demonization, the vilification of, by different stakeholders. And I, to, to some extent, everybody in society does that. Persons in death row are also thinking and feeling people. And that's what this report actually puts across. And it also allows an opportunity to look beyond the narrow context, which I mentioned earlier. And what has been very important is the multidisciplinary flavor that this particular report brings. It's brought practitioners of law, many of them very young practitioners of law, in close dialogue with psychiatrists, psychologists, and of course, finally, those considered death worthy as the book is titled. It provides an understanding and an opportunity to understand that these are feeling human beings. Many of them have been earning and responsible members of families who have been now shut away, disregarded and despised. What happened to cause this kind of transformation? That's the question we have to ask each time and that we kind of stared at every time an interview was discussed between us. I want to also at this point in time convey my appreciation of all the young interviewers who participated in this report, tracked down families in such remote parts of the country were able to gain their trust and get their perspective, which I think no report so far has really attempted to do in this kind of detail, as well as speak to respondents to understand their own lives from their own lenses, which is also very important. Although the methodology actually in the report is detailed at the very end, I think it's very important to understand the methodology because it really explains the challenges and the enormous efforts that were undertaken in planning and executing this very difficult and complex study. And that needs to be underscored. Uh, it's not just the team, it's also the different state governments, the functionaries, uh, you know, police functionaries who accorded the permissions, the prison authorities, because obviously, you know, it was not possible to get these permissions uniformly across all states, the respondents to the interviews, and of course, the families who consented with no apparent direct benefit to them. And I think that needs to be very gratefully acknowledged. There are two advantages from which a person needs to view this conundrum. One is a lens which looks not just at the event, which is the sinosure of all eyes and ears, you know, just focusing on the event, but really both the distal and the proximal antecedents to such outcomes. That behavior does not represent just the here and now, but a dynamic interplay of factors that begin very early in life and maybe even prenatal, and is a compounding of biological vulnerability, environmental influence, as well as other factors, including chance factors, can all influence a certain behavior. 
And the second, of course, which Professor Jane is going to be alluding to, are the effects of incarceration, the harsh and inhuman realities that impact on emotion and psychological consequences. So this is an attempt to shift the gaze upstream to looking at people's vulnerability to psychiatric illness, particularly psychotic disorders, mood disorders, as well as early life antecedents, including trauma at birth, which can again cause brain damage and can have pathoplastic effects on subsequent behaviors. The stories told here are replete with these inc incidents. Formative in the whole process is disadvantage, both intellectual disadvantage, as might be pointed out, socioeconomic disadvantage, adverse childhood life experiences, which, which are simply evident in almost every other case, which includes exposure to violence, childhood abuse, including sexual abuse, absent of a parents or parents have abandoned their children or have been so intoxicated that they haven't been able to provide any form of parenting. On the contrary, mistreatment of children, young children, the presence of head injury, seizures, a difficult temperament, which again might be biologically inherited or the consequence of this kind of injury, mood and emotional instability, and of course, psychosis as well as substance use. Substance use in a significant number, including current substance use. We did not ask for pre prior substance use, which might have been higher. A small number of people indeed with psychotic disorders. But what stands out in these stories is this socioeconomic adversity, no educational attainment, early adultification, children going to work at the age of nine and 10, and a host of other disadvantages. So multiple and long-term exposure to stressful events can have serious health consequences for any of us, including bringing about a change in the brain itself. And repeated exposure to negative events can particularly increase the risk to disorders like depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders. And negative experiences also change the behavioral and the cognitive responses to subsequent stressful events and increase an individual's reactivity to these events and experiences. So there is persistent and often an intergenerational social and structural exclusion, deprivation, and violence in a majority of the persons who were interviewed. Enough and more research indicates that the experiences presented in the various chapters, including the neglect during childhood, the disturbed family environment, poverty and deprivation, are underlying determinants of violence in later life, and of course, the important thing is that in the absence of support, the, the effects of these are amplified further. Such hostile environments, particularly in the formative years of a person, act as risk factors, leaving the person vulnerable to the risk of poor social outcomes, including violent behavior, suicidal attempts, as well as poor physical and mental health in later life. Maitri specifically focused on intellectual disability and this is a disorder with onset during the developmental period and can cause changes in intellectual as well as adaptive functioning in the conceptual, social, as well as practical domains. And therefore, it's not just enough to do an IQ test, but really look at how adaptive the individual is to their environment when diagnosing such disability. And once again, when you have intellectual disability coupled with head injury, seizures, psychiatric disturbances, you can see how endangering this environment can be for an individual with these deficits. So an innate vulnerability, a toxic environment, a culture of violence, including sexual violence, lack of nurturing, coupled with the absence of protective factors, such as a nurturing environment, proper parenting, a sense of community, tolerance, a set of values which are embraced in a community, limit setting for undesirable behaviors, and therefore they continue to uh, you know, to exist. And these represent a series of unfortunate events that produce compound and complex outcomes. Take the case of Mahadeva, whose alcoholic father would not only abuse his mother and him verbally, but threw him into a drum of water because he was crying. Later, an uncle takes him away, pulls him out of school, scalds him with a hot ladle every time he does not behave himself. He picks up substance use at a very young age. Take the case of Surya Khan, whose parents and brothers were murdered when he was five years old. 
Take the case of Amar Manohar, who had every possible adverse childhood experience, including abuse, absence of parents, lack of caregiver support, no support for early learning, early adultification, early onset of substance use and behavioral problems, association with deviant peers, parental substance use and hostility, multiple social adversities, all before the age of 18 years, including exposure to accident and writing. I mean, what can you expect? And of course, I'm sure the question that pops up in everybody's head is that every Amar does not land up on death row. That is a question we must seek to answer. What are the factors that can prevent people like this from becoming, you know, uh, landing up in situations like they are presently? Can we prevent deviant children from becoming deviant adults through an appropriate environment and through fostering proper community support? How do we develop resilience to adapt themselves to adverse situations while managing their mental well-being in an effective manner? Like vulnerabilities, resilience also depends on individuals as well as social factors. Individuals who have been exposed to a nurturing and supportive family environment are more resilient in stressful situations. It is not only in the context of looking at mitigating factors for the person in the dock, but to also ask ourselves as custodians of the larger society, what can we do to prevent such people from reaching where they finally do? Many of them are young men. Our obligation to do this in society is also important because it will reduce victimhood in society at a later date. Another important group inherent in this whole issue are the unvicting victims of collateral damage, the families. Families become condemned as guilty by association and the collateral damage that is caused to families because of stigma, loss, ostracization and grief that they suffer is unimaginable. And that's what we actually witnessed when we spoke to the more than 100 families. Public conversations and narratives through images, adjectives and phrases animalize the individual. This allows us to in some ways disengage, and that's what the report says, with the human to reject with haste and vigor any likeness they might have to us. The death row prisoner is therefore seen as a person outside the mod moral kinship or scope of justice and is a leg legitimate target for exclusion. The prisoner who once was us and part of our social or uh, moral sensibilities is now outside the concern of humanity. But you get a different narrative when you actually talk to the families because you find that somebody was a very concerned son, another one a responsible brother, another one a hero with a lot of friends. Life was really helpless. There was no joy at that time. He had to take care of his mother, says one of the uh, wives of one of the persons. Aparth took responsibilities for his sister's marriage. Whatever the problem, he would be there. Even if it was a hospital case, he was liked by everyone. What happened to Parth to make him turn out the way he did? So many death row prisoners have also been the sole bread earners for their families. Their absence means increased economic hardships, social ostracization, constant exploitation by different stakeholders, collective condemnation. They become identified as a death row family, guilty by association, as I mentioned, and these effects can be transgenerational, not just for the immediate family members, but can affect subsequent uh, family members as well. These families truly deserve attention. The, the report has several limitations because it's only scratched the surface of mental health concerns among death row prisoners, not having access to prison records, limited understanding, and a lack of comprehensive evaluation of many of the mental health concerns that might have occurred in prison uh, is also an issue. I know I work a lot with people with substance use. I know that anger discontrol, for example, is something that we did not look at as one of the most important dimensions of emotional, you know, I think, and I think that's also very, very important. And that is something that we need to also address again in the larger context, as well as specifically with these individuals. So Sanjeev is going to talk about the effects of incarceration. I want to end by saying, for each of us who's been involved in this piece of work, it has allowed us to understand somebody who, whom we thought was the other and underscored the need, not just for the judiciary, but for all of our stakeholders and society at large to approach this particular issue 
in a more nuanced and humane manner. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you very much, Maitri, for asking me to speak. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Jain, could you uh, go next with your opening comments, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Maitri, and thank you uh, to the audience, uh, Justice Mandridhar, uh, Professor Pratima, and all the other members. Now, at the outset, like Maitri and Pratima have already mentioned, it was a very uh, different kind of experience for us to work with fellow professionals, <clears throat> doctors and lawyers, uh, and so-called pillars of society and uh, learning each other's language, learning each other's vocabulary and uh, looking at the varying perspectives that we brought to this uh, issue. Most often we find, we find ourselves talking at each other or across the table at each other. And for a change, we were talking to each other and understanding each other's problems. And as has already been mentioned, the students who volunteered their work, who at times also expressed the sheer distress at seeing people in this kind of uh, you know, quagmire, both in the prison and in the families and in the social circumstances the families found them, I think opened up eyes and ears to the, to the range of um, exclusion that, uh, that often accompanies these kinds of uh, situations. And the applying clinical tools to this, perhaps the most marginalized and the most hidden aspects of society is a challenge in itself. We tried to develop these uh, questionnaires. We tried to see how many of them were adaptable to the Indian context. Uh, Gitanjali tried uh, hard to optimize the IQ assessment so that they could be handled by non-professionals uh, and uh, done at a, in a variety of settings. So we tried to be as meticulous and as systematic as possible in our assessment of these individuals. Now, we all know that mental illness has a very complex uh, relationship with violence itself. Most often the mentally ill are at the, at, the, uh, at the receiving end, but even then there are a number of acts of violence which can occur because of mental illness. And the law, on the other hand, uh, lays down a framework for a just and fair society and by providing rational and reasonable frameworks for behavior and thereby defining the punishments when this behavior is transgressed. However, when the behavior itself that is thought to be punished is itself arising from a lack of reason, irrationality or unreasonable behavior, it by itself creates ambiguities. As you saw in the vignettes Pratima pointed out and Maitri before that, people who've been hearing voices, people who've been extremely depressed or anxious, people who've seen addiction and violence and social breakdown all around them, how do they actually develop a framework of reason and rationality in society itself when their own lives have been so chaotic and so uh, ir irregular? Could this have been helped earlier? There was, a, there was an individual who's expelled from school, who has recurrent violence, is sent to a child, is sent to a village home, a village environment to learn discipline and perhaps distract him from all this, enters into a fight, bites off his classmates' ears, uh, again sent back to the village, a classical presentation of what we would call attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, unsocialized conduct disorder, if a psychiatrist and if mental health services had been available to this young child at 10, would the outcome on the death row be different? So even the awareness of, of this kinds of violence, of this kinds of, of uh, events that are hub, that uh, are a hub, you know, a kind, of, you know, are a for, uh, forerunner of the events that do happen, do need to be understood. Medical science, including psychiatry, has made significant progress over the last few, at least a century or half a century, instead of a blanket term of insanity, which is what was in use in the early part of the 20th century. We now have specific disease syndromes. Some people say too many disease syndromes, and these can be. These are now increasingly understood as, to a large extent, brain disorders. So head injuries, as we saw in a couple of individuals, chronic infections, somebody had had a chronic ear infection and probable abscess of the brain uh, in the temporal part of the brain, which predisposes to violence. We had several people with epilepsy, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, psychosis, and, in, and of course, addiction, which, and during intoxication, they can be very, very abnormal behavior. So the consequence of this behavior, that is the terms of punishment, therefore need to keep in mind the very real impairment of logic, affect, 
social understanding and even intelligence that all these individuals may manifest as a consequence of diseases. The role of violence and trauma in early life and deprivation, lack of schooling, all have a contributing role as uh, Pratima pointed out in uh, detail with, uh, with the various uh, vignettes from this. And these factors do work together or contribute to criminal behavior. Now, modern law specifically tries to explicitly state that we are not in the space of retribution or revenge, but are driven by reason and concern and where possible, a promise of reform. A lifetime on death row of ambiguity, of hanging in literally a no man's land, of not knowing, as it was pointed out, sometimes the individual sees the preparations for the death row in progress. Uh, mercy petitions are held pending for months and years, and the person is absolutely unaware whether he'll be alive the next day. In addition to that, all the administrative rules that have been alluded to, living a life of isolation, being looked after, looked at very differently, not allowed to work, not allowed to meet people. Now, this kind of social isolation, not the social isolation that COVID has induced, but the very real physical isolation that, that these people endure produces long-term damage to the brain. But I have the most driving, driving motivation in almost all primates and humans are primates is the need for human contact. And, and you know, we've known for years that people will do anything to have a hug, to have a pleasant conversation, to actually feel wanted by another person at any level. So the lack of that kind of environment produces this high rates of depression, the high rate of anxiety, the high rates of mental distress that we see affect almost three fourths of the people on death row. So this kind of unnecessary, in a sense, medical cruelty in which we are, in which we are fomenting a, a chronic mental trauma, a, fomenting a state of a depression is simply not appropriate for a modern society. And of course, the, in the background, the idea always exists as has already been alluded to, the death penalty being a final solution rules out any, any notion of reform or treatment. Many of the patients, many of the patients, I'm calling them patients in this context, because there was a history of seeking and being prescribed antidepressants, antipsychotics, antiepileptics for the various conditions that they had been detected to have during the period of incarceration. So in, in this entire context, the, it's not just the pathway to the crime as, as Dr. Pratham alluded to, it's all the consequences that we are talking about to the person, to the family who are, who are left to live with the stigma, who don't know what will happen to their loved one, who don't know what outcomes will have, it, it, it uh, amplifies a certain sense of arbitrariness and uh, impermanence to their whole existence. And the whimsicality of it is itself a fairly traumatic uh, process. They really don't know what, what, uh, on what reasons this capital punishment has been given. What will, be, what will be the grounds for its uh, abeyance? What will happen to their lives subsequently? So it, it uh, amplifies uh, this uh, unease that we have uh, listening to all these stories. We did go through each, each of these stories in detail uh, and, and uh, from a professional level. And as Pratima pointed out, it could, each one of them was a textbook example of how things could go wrong and how things were often outside the realm of control of the individual. So when we are trying to punish a person for reasons that were outside the person's control, on which they actually had no capacity to, to employ the their own reasonableness, then the, then the capital punishment itself becomes a bit of an unreasonable exercise. So in addition to uh, the uh, the facts of the of the matter, which are the obviously the legal, uh, uh, you know, prerogative, the social and the personal outcomes of this do need to be kept in mind. And I think this document goes some way in understanding, as has been emphasized over and over again, the actual humanness of these individuals. These are marginalized. These are locked away. These are people we do not talk about, except in the most uncharitable of terms. 
in many ways this these attitudes do reflect what was common all over the world when executions were a time for public celebration or public forgetfulness but hopefully in the 21st century we can come to a more understanding and empathetic approach to this whole problem and uh, it uh, it was a mixed pleasure working with this population uh, it brought us face to face with situations that we don't really see in our clinics and our hospitals so thank you for the opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, further progress on this uh, very important aspect of uh, social engineering or social reform thank you so much for this opportunity thank you so much dr jain thank you dr jain and dr murthy once again for guiding us and being there for us and with us on this journey of the last uh, many many years uh, justice mulidhar could i invite you to give your opening comments on the report please yes good evening to everyone uh, it's such a pleasure listening to dr pratima murthy dr sanjeev jain and of course uh, by three's uh, delineation of what the report is about every time and i much look forward to the work produced by project 39a because uh, one can expect high quality stuff and as a student of law i i deliberately use those words because uh, every passing day as a judge i am reminded of how much i do not know and uh, this report further tells me that there is so much for me to know as a judge and i must thank Uh, two very erudite scholars in the field of psychiatry dr prithiba burti and dr sanjeev jain for guiding this uh, interdisciplinary research and producing such uh, uh, scholarly work for us to engage with i remember that it was the year 1998 that uh, i had the uh, opportunity of listening to justice alvi sacks who was giving a lecture at the timurti hall it was one of his first visits to india for those who may not be uh, familiar just as alvi sacks was a judge of the constitutional court of south africa and uh, a remarkable uh, legal scholar apart from being one of the model judges for many of us and uh, he spoke of uh, what he would describe as four kinds of truths so uh, he said uh, as he understood it and uh, this lecture was in the context of the truth and reconciliation commission the trc which was set up as a constitutional body under the new constitution of south africa to deal with this uh, trauma soon after the ending formal legal ending of apartheid he understood those four truths as uh, microscopic truths as uh, logical truths as experiential truths and dialogic truths and then he proceeded to uh, further expand those four kinds of truths logical truth he said is deductive logic where through the tool of logic you arrive at truths experiential truths he in fact cited the instance of uh, mahatma gandhi and he said by a whole reason of trial and error in individual lives you begin to discover more and more truths and uh, dialogic truth and this is what he said was uh, attempted at in the truth and reconciliation commission where you bring the accused to the victim face to face and help them describe that there are more than one ways to see the event that had occurred and how that provided the opportunity for healing and uh, why it was a very important aspect of the truth and reconciliation committee's work itself that there is this dialogic truth and of course for all students of law in that auditorium we were waiting to hear what was microscopic truth about and he said microscopic truth is what judges arrive at through this whole process of a trial we try to exclude things that are not relevant they say which is not admissible they don't allow witnesses to answer except yes and no to many of these close ended questions so many of the things which would otherwise become uh, essential for appreciating what had happened somehow gets excluded in the process of law because we are strict about the laws of evidence the criminal procedure code and how we interpret the laws 
and therefore we tend to keep out things which we consider are not relevant. So, and he said this microscopic truth, therefore, can get it wrong. And hearing that lecture, I was reminded of the Rashomon effect, what I would call of the Rashomon effect. And I'm sure Dr. Sanjeev Jain and Dr. Pratimamurthy know what I'm talking about, as would many legal scholars here. Akira Kurosawa's wonderful film, Rashomon, where he demonstrates in a very simple kind of a way, but in a very profound kind of a way, that when the same event is looked at from different angles, you get four different narratives. So I think one aspect of this report is to give us another narrative of who the person who has been convicted of the crime is. So I think this uh, report delves deep into this aspect and uh, points out to the field of law that you need to acknowledge the person you're dealing with at least at the stage of sentencing such person. I had, of course, I must uh, disclose to all of you that I had a long conversation with uh, both Maitri and uh, Dr. Anus Surendranath on various aspects of the report. I've been given only seven minutes here, so I would not delve much into the, uh, 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 what we discussed. But this much is certainly important, and I would like to read out one aspect of the report which points to what I'm trying to say when it comes to uh, the sentencing aspect. I'm reading the report itself, already forsaken by state and society, an overwhelming majority of death row prisoners are a population which was not given a chance at life earlier. And when sentenced to death, are told they deserve no chance at life either. It is a double whammy, and we seem to have few solutions. The death penalty sentencing framework provides that opportunity. It empowers the judge to undertake a searching inquiry into an individual's life, to look at them as an individual in their own right, without comparing them to the multitude of others about whom there is no real information. It is an opportunity to not ask, so what? But to answer, what if? What if the person had some things going for them? And what if they were given a chance, even if behind prison walls? But I must end on a cautionary note. We are in this report projecting the person who has been charged with the crime or maybe who has been found guilty of the crime as a victim, as a victim of circumstances, as a victim of past injustices perpetrated on this person. So you would definitely be faced with the question that you yourself anticipated, so what? And I think this report should be able to foster a dialogue with the persons who ask this question, so what? And that standpoint, that standpoint which asks this question, so what, would be perhaps from the standpoint of the victim of the crime, and which also this report acknowledges, I must point out at page 272. And it says to reduce this complexity to a battle between the experiences and lives of the accused versus the experiences and lives of the victim of the offense is to do disservice to both. But the note of caution is this, that everybody is looking for closure. The victim is as much looking for a closure as the uh, person accused of the crime is. In fact, your uh, video presentation ended with this note saying that uh, I would rather have an immediate execution rather than a slow death. So from both from the points of the victim and from the point of the perpetrator, they need closure. And I think both need to know the truth. The society needs to know the truth. So this is a complex exercise the judge faces. At what stage in the trial should a judge undertake this exercise or should the judge undertake it or should the defense undertake it? Should the prosecution undertake it? In fact, this was one of the points of discussion I had with Dr. Surendranath. And it was in the context of what the Supreme Court has been doing in the recent past. I must uh, draw the attention of both Dr. Jain and to Dr. Murthy to this uh, complex uh, set of factors that are 
with the court to consider. One is what we call the crime test. The other is what we call the criminal test. And we've got the third, which is the rarest of rare test. And this has all evolved through judgments of the Supreme Court. So the entire jurisprudence in this area accommodates the concerns that some of the two of you have been expressing, that we need to get to know the criminal or we get to know the person accused of the crime better than just focusing on the crime itself. And this has come from a judgment delivered in way back 40 years ago in Bachchan Singh. And that has been further and further refined in judgments of the Supreme Court. We are like, trying to look at the complex set of factors that need to be considered by a court. So this dialogue between law and psychiatry is not a new one. It started with the uh, many more than 100 years ago when the Indian Lunacy Act was uh, uh, enacted. And then it has continued to the Mental Health Act. And we've had various issues concerning mental illnesses of prisoners come before the courts. Of course, both, I think, Dr. Jain and Dr. Murthy would be aware of the Sheila Barse case of 1994. And the first real collaboration we had between the fields of psychiatry and the field of law. But this needs to be carried forward. And I think, therefore, this report makes a very important contribution in that effort. I must also draw your attention to the fact that there have been two judgments of the Delhi High Court where we've invited psychiatric evaluation of prisoners, but in the context of the uh, question whether the prisoner is capable of being reformed. But I was told both by Ms. Uh, Maitreyi Mishra and Dr. Surendranath that this report is not about that exercise at all. It is not about inviting the field of psychiatry for that exercise, which is a separate exercise. But this is only to understand who is this person on death row. But on that other exercise, judges are actively engaged with. We have a very recent order of the Supreme Court in Manoj Jain versus State of Madhya Pradesh on 29 September 2021, where three judges, a uh, three judge bench of the uh, Supreme Court, Justice Lalit, Justice Ravindra Bhatt, and Justice Bela Trivedi, have called for psychiatric and psychological evaluation of the three prisoners on death row. And we will wait to watch what is the outcome of that. Uh, I have really uh, had my eyes open because of this report further. And I must say there is so much learning for judges to do, so much to know. And uh, I'm sure this is an ongoing exercise. There'll be many more such rich contributions for Project 39. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Mulidhar, for those very, very kind words and for uh, the, the conversation you've started on uh, reformation, uh, particularly through the Delhi High Court judgments. Um, we only unfortunately have three more minutes remaining before uh, we have to close the event. Uh, but uh, if I could ask a follow-up question to any of the panelists, I think it would be this. And I think it goes to what Justice Murlidhar also spoke about, the dialogic uh, um, aspect. Uh, Given what the report talks about in terms of the various adverse childhood experiences that these prisoners have gone through, various traumas that these prisoners have gone through pre-incarceration, pre the event, much, much before the event, as children, how, how then do we start talking about both society's responsibility? Because it is very often, the death penalty is given in the name of public outrage, public consciousness, social consciousness. And I, I wonder what, how we interpret those findings in that context. How do we look at, how do we even try and start thinking about our social responsibility, our social consciousness for prisoners before it is too late, before we are confronted with them in, in the light that we are? Dr. Murthy had to leave. Dr. Jain, would you like to go first, Justice Mulida? No, that's uh, very, very tough <laughs> um, uh, uh, issue to, uh, to even consider because on the other hand, although Pratima used the phrase of deviant children growing up to be deviant adults, the vast majority that uh, it must be emphasized that all over the world, the vast majority do as children grow and as adolescents mature, most of this 
so-called antisocial behavior does come down. And uh, that's in the, in, the large, in the larger context. However, the, the factors of, of mental illness, the factors of psychological ill health, if picked up early, can be reduced to some extent. Now, the limits of that are obviously governed by social recognition of this distress, the fact that there are systems to help, there are interventions possible, that there is a social receptivity to this kind of uh, awareness that deprivations, violence, um, unequal societies do predispose to criminal behavior. Now, this is a social issue which bedevils all societies and we cannot have a crime-free society. And we cannot have, just like we cannot have uh, a society free of, uh, of the mentally ill. So I, I don't think there's a specific answer to your query, but if all one can hope is that if our social responses and our medical services and our interventions are targeted, are sensitive enough to pick up these behaviors early enough, perhaps these kinds of unfortunate, you know, a series of unfortunate events, as you pointed out, occur to this extent, could perhaps be mitigated. But I don't think there's anything specific that we can, we can think of at this point in time as a, a specific intervention. Justice Murlidhar, would you? Yeah, actually, I wanted to just uh, go back to uh, what the Supreme Court has been doing. Uh, I, I would like to draw attention of at least uh, uh, Dr. Jain and to uh, what the Supreme Court said in Shankar Kishan Rao Khade versus the state of Maharashtra. It's a 2013 judgment. And what kind of factors uh, weigh with the judges? Like I pointed out earlier, the crime test, the criminal test, and the mm -hmm. rarest of rare test. And they've moved away from what is called a balancing test. They say there's no validity to a balancing test. It's not like in a scale, you put down aggravating factors and mitigating factors and then say which outweighs the other. And therefore, you know, it's, no, it's not a zero sum game. So here, if there is, I'm just quoting the judgment. It says that if there is any circumstance favoring the accused, like lack of intention to commit the crime, mm -hmm. possibility of reformation, young age of the accused, not a menace to the society, no previous track record, etc. And that's a very uh, uh, if, you know, pregnant, etc. The criminal test may favor the accused to avoid the capital punishment. Even if both the tests are satisfied, that is the aggravating circumstance to the fullest extent. And in most of these cases, we should be prepared uh, to have the crime being the most horrific crime and no mitigating circumstance favoring the accused, still we have to apply the finally the rarest of rare test. And that test, the Supreme Court uh, explains, depends on the perception of the society that is society centric and not judge centric. That is whether the society will approve the awarding of death sentence to certain types of crimes or not. While applying that test, the court has to look into a variety of factors like the society's aberrance, extreme indignation and antipathy to certain types of crimes like sexual assault and murder of minor girls, intellectually challenged, suffering from physical disability, old and infirm women with those dis disabilities and so on. So I think we will need inputs from the field of psychiatry, also from the point of view of the victims. Mm -hmm. And this is very, very, very uh, important from my, I mean, as I see it. Because before the judge, it's a very, very difficult task that the judge has to perform. And uh, we need to have, therefore, a 360 degree understanding. And while this report is remarkably well on getting out the narratives of the uh, prisoner and the prisoner's families, I think we need to also understand the narratives, other narratives of the victims, the victims' families, and uh, what, what the whole sentencing exercise should be about how it should address a larger number of concerns. So uh, there could be several kinds of victims. Like I think this report tries to tell us that death row prisoners are themselves victims. But uh, before the judge, uh, there has to be dealing with the concerns of several victims. So I think uh, it's a complex exercise. I would agree more with Dr. Jain that it is a very, very complex exercise. I, I, I believe that in some countries, a kind of victim statement is, form, is a formal part of the sentencing itself in certain yes. societies, yes. that there is a victim, uh, 
the victims are called and, and the family members are also asked to give a statement as to whether they are satisfied or what is their response to the judgments. And that in itself brings an amount of closure. But whether our legal system has a, has a provision for that. No, this, uh, yeah. yes, actually that provision is what the space you have in the court. Right. The sentencing hearing, I think over these judgments has become a more and more complex exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is how it should be. It should be a complex exercise. And because uh, as you rightly pointed out, Dr. Jain, uh, the sentence is an irreversible one and if executed is an uncorrectable one. So the judges are deeply conscious of that. The Supreme Court certainly is. And therefore, even this recent order in Manoj J tends to address that complexity of the sentencing exercise. I think just to just to add to what uh, Justice Murlidhar has just said about the complexity of the exercise, I think a recent Supreme Court judgment on this point actually likened the whole sentencing exercise to a socio-legal exercise and, and urged the judges uh, to look at the person before them in, in, in the whole complexity of the factual history and, and, and more importantly, I think the phrase that the judgment uses and in the balance of equities. I think that's an important feature of the death penalty system that is hopefully going to develop in a more humane uh, way where justice can be done whether where, and, and, and lead to justice reforms in the criminal justice system where neither the victim nor the accused are like the report says, uh, are done a disservice, uh, where justice stands strong for both of them. With this, on this note, I would like to close this panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Justice Murlidhar. Thank you, Dr. Jain, for uh, being part of this uh, excellent discussion. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you to the audience uh, for listening in. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.